turning into John in chapter 1. And we're going to uh, review a little bit of what we did last week and then cover a, a few more things. We've got slight translation issues with some of this. Uh, when I say issues, we've got things that we're familiar with. We're especially familiar in the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified among us. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only, the Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed Him. Now, if we read that in the King James, or we read it in an expanded Bible, we read it in some other versions, we get some minor changes of wording. And wording sometimes can be vital. Of course, all wording that we read in our English translation should be, not always is, but should be coming from a translation of the Greek into English. Well, that first two verses, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning, it's familiar. The grammatical construction in Greek permits translators the freedom to write it that way. To say, Word of God, Word of God. But that's not exactly the way it's written in the Greek. And this is one time I wish we'd stuck with the Greek. The English structure has been twisted by some most notably the Jehovah's Witnesses, who in their New World Translation Bible have it worded this way, and tell me if you can hear the difference. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. This one was in the beginning with God. Immediately, we as Christians should recognize a major issue. Jesus was not just a God. He was not some minor deity. We don't believe in minor deities. We only really believe in a God, one God, solo, 
great person, one God. He was God. Jesus was God. He was part of the Holy Trinity, consisting of the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John wrote this gospel because he was taking a stand against this very heresy. This one heresy is a major reason that John wrote this gospel. This saying that Jesus was just some a God, just some other, and that meaning there's multiple gods, had emerged in the early church as heresy. Now, on one hand, the Jehovah's Witnesses translation seems to follow the Greek grammar correctly. In Koine Greek, which John used to write his gospel, there is a definite article. We use the word the when we want a definite article. And a definite article means if we say, don't, where is the book, we're talking about a specific book. But if we say, pick up, pick up a book, we can just pick up any one of them. Doesn't matter. But if we say pick up the book, we know specific. That is a definite article. In English, we have the indefinite article. We use a, an, it can be any of them. It's a ball. Hey, let's go to a ball game. Okay, well, you know, you've got uh, the Raiders playing in Las Vegas, you've got but the hockey game, you, you know, with, with who is it here? The Golden Knights. Golden Knights. Uh, we're supposed to be going to be getting a baseball team into Las Vegas. So let's go to a ball game. Well, which one? And you know, and let's not forget UNLV with their basketball team, which is always one of the top in the nation. But if we say let's go to the ball game, again, we're specific, specifying. And of course, for those who are watching, it's whatever the teams are in your area. It could be minor league, it could be the high school game, whatever. So, because there is no indefinite article in the Koine Greek, you just write the word, the noun, without anything. If you want the definite, then you use ho or one of its variations, which means the. So, the Koine Greek does not have the definite article with the word God, who that they translate as a God. But, and because the way the English was translated, you could say that Jehovah's Witnesses are correct in putting that little A in there. But that's not the way it's written in the Greek. A direct word-for-word -word translation of John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is this. In the beginning, or in the origin, or in that, or at the starting point, at the beginning of all things, on that by which anything begins to be. In other words, the absolute beginning. In the beginning was the word. So it was. And the word was with the God, and God was the word. Notice that. The original Greek says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, and God was the word. In this case, we don't need to have a definite article, because we've already defined God as being definite. And so, when the Jehovah's Witnesses put a little A in there and change it to a little G, that is not proper translation of the Greek. And it says, He was in the beginning with the God. He. Now, what did the Jehovah's Witnesses have done? 
They've taken this and that he in the second verse, they've translated it into a neuter word. In Greek, you have the neuter, you have the masculine and the feminine for everything. Everything is one or the other. They use the neuter to take it away from being God and Jesus is one and man. One would expect the construction to remain the same. Word God, word God, word God. But by changing the last phrase to God, word, the definite article is not required, and it also makes the sentence itself even stronger. God himself was the word. This is the point that John is driving home. Jesus, who we get to in verse 14, is absolutely equal with and is and is with God. With the second verse, another error is made, like I just pointed out. The translation of autos is he. And autos is the word. They have another word, if it's auton, if it's a neuter, but they translate it in theirs as otherwise. Autos can be modified to give it a neuter or feminine meaning, but here it is clearly masculine, and yet the Jehovah's Witness interlinear translation. Because they even have to give out their interlinear translations, and it's really kind of okay. But it clearly shows that they are making it neuter. Again, a false rendering. Or a mistake in rendering. But let's go back up to our sentence here. We have the word chai, which is and. Normally translated and. So if we use that one, in the beginning was the word and chai. The word was God. Chai, God was the word. But chai can make it a little even stronger here. It does mean and. It can also be translated as even, also, moreover, or indeed. So let's try this. And it's a proper translation. In the beginning, what's the word? Indeed, the word was with the God. Moreover, God was the word. See how it changes just slightly? And emphasizing. And this is the very point that John wants to drive home. John uses the term logos. He personifies logos saying it was alive, active, powerful. Logos, we translate as word. But it means a lot more than just word. It was a term used in the Greek philosophy and in Hebrew for more than just the word. This passage, going from verse 1 all the way down through 18, this passage down through verse 14 is the only place John uses the word or the term logo. At 14, he immediately changes it, and we know we're talking about Jesus. In verse 14, he identifies the logos as being Jesus Christ. Many scholars believe that verses 1 to 18 were either sung or used liturgically in worship service. Kind of like the way churches used to just say the Our Father or you know, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, as they call it, the Apostles' Prayer, if anybody who you're talking with. Just like we used to recite the Apostles' Creed, this was something that scholars believe the early church did. They did that probably for at least the first couple of centuries, maybe a little bit longer. Some scholars go so far as to suggest that John may not have been the initial person to write this. He may have used those words, that those 18 verses, because it was so familiar to, his, to those who would be reading, and he just borrows them and puts them in there. Today we would say this plagiarism, but back then they didn't worry about that. That was not an issue for them. So he could easily have done that. 
be no worse than us taking a song, one of the songs, and reciting it. The vast majority of scholars agree that the Gospel of John was written as a message to Christians in the first century that Jesus was fully man and fully God. A number of false teachers were teaching various heresies and had been teaching them for some time. Paul addressed some of these in the letters to the Galatians, Colossians, Corinthians. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I give you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready. Wait a minute. Now, it goes on and takes it in a slightly different direction. But he's saying, you should be ready for the solid truth. You should be defending your own selves against the false teachings. You're not. And I have to go back to the beginning and teach you again the beginning truth. The preacher who preached the sermon in Hebrew said, in Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain. Since you have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principle of God's revelation again. You need milk not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the God's message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. We can go through and we can pick up a lot of other things um, throughout the writings of Paul, throughout uh, probably in some of Peter and all the others, that they're trying to fight this, the heresies that were there. Some of these were teaching a false religion, a very false religion, and masquerading it as Christianity. There's three letters, and we know from having our study in, in Revelation, that there were seven letters to the churches that were written. Chapters 2 and 3 addresses this. It was a huge problem. False teaching occurs in three of those, teach, of those letters. You have resisted. You're not resisting. What are you doing? False teaching, unfortunately, has been part of the church for the past 2,000 years. One major set of these false teachings have been gathered under a title, or under a name, of Gnosticism. Despite the efforts of the Apostle John and church leaders who followed after him, Gnosticism is still alive and well on planet Earth. We find it in the New Age movement. We find it in groups that directly, that directly claim to be Gnostic. It was interesting as I did some of this to find just how many different groups are saying, we are Gnostics. And then we have the Mormon Church, who are purely Gnostic. I hear that I said that if you ask a question because you can't understand something, whatever, and you'll be told, oh, when you're more spiritual, you'll understand this. That's a common straight out Gnosticism from the first century. Gnostics were not and are not monolithic. A few basic teachings united them about 2,000 years ago. And then, in those same teachings, still same beliefs, Still unite them today, but those similarities aside, there were huge differences as well. 
let's pause a moment. Last week, we discussed the fact that the Apostle John was the accepted author of this gospel up until the 1700s, when it started to be questioned as to who wrote it. Didn't matter what the early church fathers said, the people who knew John, or knew specifically that he had written it, they started to say, well, you know, maybe John didn't write this, and we covered that last week in a good amount of detail. Well, most people have accepted the fact that John wrote it. Last week, when we did our study in Revelation, we found that there was not a lot of consensus as to when the book of Revelation was written. Was it written prior to 1964 AD? Was it written prior to the fall of uh, when Rome conquered Jerusalem and the walls fell in 70 AD? Or was it written in the 90s? It also created a problem how you understand the book. Well, fortunately, when we come to the Gospel of John, there used to be a lot of questions, there were early questions on, as to when it was written. Was it written early? Like, say, before the time when Paul and Peter were killed? Was it written before the fall of Jerusalem? Or was it written in the 90s? Or was it maybe and probably written by somebody claiming to be John in the second century, so maybe 135, 140 AD. But then archaeology, archaeologists have found manuscripts or portions of manuscripts that date carbon copy dating and everything else to the very early stages of the second century. Maybe as late as, as, late as 120 AD, a piece of manuscript was found in Egypt and they said, okay, it wouldn't have gotten to Egypt overnight. And it apparently was a, not a, was a copy, so therefore that's going to change things. So they said, okay, so it could not have been written any later than 100 AD. And most likely earlier than that. Many other scholars have come to the point of saying it was written a pro and between 80 AD and 100 AD. We can ask the question, where was this gospel, this gospel written? It was either, one theory is that John wrote it when he was on Patmos. At about the same time, they knew before he was writing his uh, revelation, he could have written it, while he was exiled there, or while he was living in Ephesus, he wrote it there. It's easy enough to say, I can accept that it was written by the apostle, so what difference does it make who wrote it? It actually makes a lot of difference who wrote it. Nowhere in the book of John does it say, John wrote it. But, he named every other apostle except himself. He just refers to himself as the, the apostle Jesus loved, or the apostle who was there. He does not say he wrote it and he keeps his name out. That is a mark of a man of humility who's saying to say, I'm unimportant. I'm not important. What's important is a story here. And if we accept the word of the early fathers who said John wrote it, and we take that out and we say, well, now, you know, somebody else wrote it. Okay, so if somebody else wrote it, even though he doesn't name himself, and he's the only apostle not named, and he says the apostle that Jesus loved, and he writes himself into the story in different points, and he didn't write it, then that becomes a lie. 
it becomes a major big problem. If I cannot take and read the Gospel of John and know for sure that it was written by the Apostle John, then what else can I not believe in that book? What else becomes a question? If you read commentary by conservatives, or the liberals as well, of course they're trying to tell you somebody else wrote it a lot of times, or whatever they're trying to tell you. But if you're reading commentary and New Testament introduction, They'll always tell you who wrote whatever piece it is already. And they'll tell you why. And they spend that money. Like, I don't want to know that. I don't want to get into the Word. What's going on here, you know? We are in the Word. It's important. It's also important to know what was the primary reason it was written. Who was it written to? The audience. Who was the intended audience? Well, we know we can take each of the four Gospels and we can determine an audience reads. Now, John Barnett, pastor and seminary professor, uh, did, his, uh, did some study time underneath uh, John MacArthur with an associate pastor with him, assistant pastor. He writes this, and he's not the only one, but he's summarizing very quickly the points that we know. He writes, The Gospels record Christ's ministry to the four groups of people then and now in the world. The Jews who loved the scriptures and prophecies of God. They would only listen to one of their own. So Matthew speaks to the Jews and the deeply religious of our, of our day. So those who are extremely dick, they want to be super religious, that's who Matthew's writing to. Mark spoke to the Romans. These were leaders, and leadership and action impressed them. They knew nothing of the scriptures of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, but they knew everything about power. So this group comes to this group comes an action-packed gospel of the powerful ministry of Christ. Mark uses the word and 1,375 times to tie together the endless actions of Christ. Just like our modern successful businessmen and women, they want a God who can powerfully meet their deepest need. We know that, we, aside, and aside on this, we know that Mark wrote for Peter. We know that Peter was a man of action. You go to the rest of the garden, what did Peter do? He sliced it off the ear. He missed. He got the ear and he sliced it going for the throat. He didn't have that. He was a fisherman. What did he know about a sword? But he was a man of action. When Jesus said, Who would have been saying that I am? They got these disciples all answered and gave them three. Then he said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Holy One of God, the Messiah, the Son of God. And immediately after that, Jesus starts to talk about his death, and Peter's like, No way! He was a man of action, not a lost sight at times. But he, he put his mouth, put his mouth, more often than not, because he was trying to get it across. And that's what comes across in Mark. We did some teaching, but we had a lot more action than Mark. Okay, Luke. Luke was a Greek, not a Jew, and he's speaking to Greeks, Greeks and Romans, to the uh, educated classes, to the pagan world. The Greeks loved culture, beauty, and ideas. Happiness to them can be found in the pursuit of truth. Luke fills his book with insights, interviews, songs, and details that fascinate the inquiring mind. Pick up the National Enquirer. So today, truth seekers find Jesus in Luke. 
But you know that when Jesus was before Pilate, and Pilate said, what is truth? That story is in Luke. Not in Matthew. Not in Mark or John. But now John, his audience, he wrote to everyone. Because everyone needs to meet God and only Jesus can reveal him. In this book, we meet an absolutely powerful God in human flesh who controls and rules the universe. He created. So the best known verse in the, is the best of all to offer that God loves all and offers all his son as their only hope. So think about the writing of John. John was the last of the Gospels to be written. Depending on which scholar you're reading, or whatever, you have Mark. That is believed, very accurately, I believe, to have been written first. It could have been written as early as 40, 45 AD. And it probably was. It could have been written a little bit earlier, earlier than that. There are some who say that John was written in 40 AD. So the other three had to write sooner. Then, Matthew and Luke are written next. When I was in seminary, what I was taught was to figure about 40 to 45 for Mark, about 60 to 70 AD for Mark, for Matthew and Luke, being written almost uh, contemporary, almost at the same time, maybe at the same time, we don't know. And then John was written uh, some years later. In writing the Gospels, they had their own experiences, Matthew and John, Peter dictating to Mark, but had their own experiences. Luke didn't have those experiences. But Luke did more like a newspaper article, or a magazine article, a research paper. He went and interviewed and gathered all his data. Okay, was believed that there was a, what we call a Q document. What a Q document is, was a list of the sayings of Jesus Christ that he had said over the time, so maybe somebody's gotten down the very thing Jesus said, but in itself is not a gospel, but it's a filling. So we have those things. And in using Q, Mark may or may not have had access to Q. We don't know. Some scholars say yes, and some scholars say no. And then Mark wrote. Then Luke and Matthew borrowed from Mark. They read into Mark, and they said, okay, I need to put this in here. I don't need to put that in here. And they can come, what we call this, and they use Q, and they use some other research, other documents that they did research on. And of course, Matthew, having been the tax collector, what are tax collectors known for? Paperwork. They do the paperwork, as he just said. They keep a ledger, and Matthew was probably fairly well educated and could, could, could keep a a log, if you will, of all the various things that happened from he, when he started following Christ. Nothing before. You would have to go out and gather the data like anyone else. So, put them all together. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them synoptic. As in a synopsis. As a synopsis of Jesus' life. Written with um, certain points of view. Who's your audience? Matthew is all concerned about uh, showing that Jesus fulfills prophecy. Mark did a little bit of that. John a little tiny bit of that. Luke a little bit of that. Matthew is very heavily showing that Jesus fulfills prophecy. Why? Because that's what's so important to the Jews. To show that he was a prophet. He was the one who was prophet. He was perfect. He was uh, proclaimed ahead of time. Then you get Luke. Luke is more concerned with showing the story from the birth of Christ. Yes, uh, Matthew has the birth and the uh, genealogy, like Luke, Luke does, but they have different stories. 
What Luke has is stuff that you have to have a personal relationship and go out and interview and ask this question. So Mary, how did you know you were going to be giving birth to Jesus? How did you get that word? Well, and you were engaged. How do, I, how do you feel about it? And that's how you get those stories in Luke. So those coming down, they give us a synopsis of, of Jesus' life. And they, they show us who he is. And they don't deny the, the reality of Jesus being God. But they're written from a viewpoint of this is Jesus the man who is also God. They're written from the what the like first person accounts, if you will, and they're written very much as a first person account, showing that this is what we were doing, and we were doing, and we were doing, and we were doing. We come to John. A lot of questions would have come up. You've got uh, these gospels saying this or that. How do we work with this? There'd be things that hey, you know what, guys. Uh, we didn't put in this piece of information that's very vital. We left that out. Uh, let's fix this. Let's answer those questions. And let's give an account that Jesus is God. Jesus is God in man. And that's where we get the gospel of John. Now the Gnostic what they were teaching, one, they believed that a, a common belief was that there were many gods. There was some god who was way up the totem pole, if you will, and he overall everything, but he had gone on vacation. He ain't worrying about nothing. He's out there, he's unapproachable, and you see, he's had the mother gods come off of him. Some little sunbeams like kind of thing, whatever. These things that are broken off of him, but he's still old. Okay, and one of them is a demiurge. Half an urge. And this demiurge, well, the Jews call him Yahweh. Jehovah. El. He screwed up. He created stuff. He took the spiritual and he made physical, material world. He made man, he made the world, he made the animals, the plant, and he messed up things horribly. And he's evil and he's ugly and he just ain't got it. So now this other, this way up here, ugh, I gotta fix that. Hey, you. You're, one, you're also off of me. Go fix it. He said, and he says, Jesus, to try to bring this back. And what it is, you've got the God spark in you. And you just have to wake up and realize that you've got the God spark in you so that you can start working your way back up to, to the deities and stuff. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, Take a class on world religion and uh, the, the anthropology of, of uh, faith, uh, faith religion, you know, the uh, folk religion and stuff. And we had here we have an assignment to choose a religion out there that we're not familiar with or that we wanted more about that's not Christianity or not what we're familiar with. So. I chose, let's go look into it, what is the New Age stuff? Went to a New Age store and spent some time at the store, examining some things, got a couple of uh, things for research purposes there, and found they were going to have this woman who was coming and speaking. And so I said, okay, you know what, I'll go back and listen to this thing. They had a little altar thing set up, table with something on it, some flowers. She comes in. Singing a few melodic voice, and she talks about how, well, you see, among the human beings that are on this earth are some beings who really aren't human, and we've got to wake them up. They've got to become aware of just who they are, 
And the gun are getting touched with their godness that, that's within them so that they can change this world. What? What are you talking about? Soil, 
that produce fruit up toward heaven, some 60 times as much as some 120. Nothing really wrong with that saying. It's pretty close to scripture. But the others weren't. But you mix a little bit of a, you mix a little bit of truth in with your life. Saying number 13, Thomas's confession. Jesus said to his disciples, if you were to compare me to someone, who would you say I'm like? Simon Peter said to him, you're like just an angel. Matthew said, you're like a wise philosopher. Thomas said, teacher, I am completely unable to say who you're like. Jesus said, I'm not your teacher because you've drunk. You've become intoxicated by the bubbly spring I've measured out. He took him, Thomas, aside and told him three things. When Thomas returned to his companions, they asked, What did Jesus say I'll tell you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you even one of the things that he said to me, you'll pick up stones and cast them at me, and fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Does that sound scriptural? Does that sound anything like anything else in the Bible? This is the stuff that came out of the Gnostics. There was one, not one gospel I read uh, a while back, and it said, well, only men can get to heaven. Well, what about Mary Magdalene? Oh, God's already made her a man. Her sex change operation, I guess. But, what do we do with these things? How should we treat them? Gnosticism was leading people astray. They were saying, hey, you want to be smart and wise? Come with us. Be smart. Know what these things are. And understand that God didn't really say what he, the truth out to the people. He was hiding it. And if you come with us, we'll give you the truth. Well, John has to contest this. John has to tell the people, this is what God has said. John is different from the other three Gospels. I encourage people to always read the book we're studying at one sitting, because then you'll see things that you'll miss otherwise. In the Gospel of John, there's not a single error. Jesus didn't teach in parables in the book of John. He uses parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Instead, he uses speeches. This is John recording the information. And he's recording stories. He's recording events that the others don't even have. For example, he speaks to Nicodemus. He says Nicodemus came to him by night. And we have a long, lengthy discourse. A conversation that's recorded when Jesus tells him what he has to do to be saved. We have others. I know we're getting down in time here, but I hope we... I think we've said enough on the Gnosticism. Hopefully to understand that it really had a bunch of stuff going on that really, who, uh, who were these people? Some things that are important about John. John writes directly from a third person omniscient viewpoint. Now, Lori can tell you exactly what that means, to have me a third person omniscient viewpoint when we're writing. The writer who's using that type of approach knows what's going on with each, in the, each character in the story, what each character is thinking, knows what's going to happen in the future, knows what happened in the past, and how it all ties together. If we're taking a first person, uh, and of course writing it a third person means they're writing it, they said, he said, she said, and doesn't say, I said. The other three gospels are written from an eye perspective. 
Even in Mark, when Mark is writing it for Peter, it's still a first person more than anything. And Mark does write himself into the story at one specific point. Something Mark puts in the story and in his gospel that only Mark would have known. And that is when Jesus was arrested in the garden and everybody was fleeing. It, he says, and a young man was running away and somebody grabbed his cloak and the man ran away naked. Who was really writing about somebody running away naked unless it was himself putting himself in the story saying how scared everybody was. Well, it says here, the Gospel of John contains many unique and memorable stories not found in other sources. Uh, we already talked about Nicodemus changing water into wine. Uh, the Samaritan at the well, the woman at the well. Jesus saving the woman from being stoned, who is caught in adultery. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. The healing of a man born blind. And washing the disciples' feet. Interestingly, when, G when John is describing the Last Supper, he does not talk about the creation of the Eucharist. He doesn't talk about the cup and the bread being broken. He talks instead about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and saying, Be a this, be a servant to all. Why? Because they already had the communion going on. That was already being done. The Lord's Supper was already being celebrated, and the other three Gospels had already included it. So he doesn't need to read it. And John is the only place that we're told that Thomas was absent when Jesus first came to the apostles, but they were gathered together and they had to have a second time to see Jesus. These are things that John writes about. But they're giving us other details we don't have in the other Gospels. In the Gospel of John, Jesus cleanses the temple right off the bat. Very early in the ministry. The synoptics place the event in the last week of his life. Gospel of John, approximately one third to one half of John deals with that last week and, the, and everything from the trial and the death and the resurrection of Christ and him showing himself alive and everything, much more so than the other gospel. Because, again, he's emphasizing the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and he is God and fully man. You have in John, you have, uh, the emphases are just different. The language that was used. John uses a much smaller vocabulary than any of the other writers. Why? Because he's, he's writing it as a simple man, and he's writing it himself, and he's using what he knows, and they say that John is the easiest of the Gospels to read in Greek. So he's using the whole Greek. I know that when I was in seminary and taking my Greek classes, we used John as a teaching point for getting through, because it is easier. Because John was definitely writing as a second language person here. <clears throat> in both Matthew and Mark summarize Jesus' message with the words repent for the kingdom of God is at hand but the language of the kingdom of God doesn't disappear completely from John he's in there five times it is significantly muted and replaced by the message about Jesus Jesus' identity and the importance of believing in him are far more central to the theology of the gospel of John than in the synoptics. It's not the message of Jesus is totally different, because it's not. But the change in emphasis is very noticeable. Something that comes about because of it being written last, answering the question, and addressing uh, problems in the church. Problems that these other gospels weren't addressing.
In the first gospel, in the three synoptic gospels, the author is writing himself as being very heavily involved in the things going on. And he don't take the time to reflect back. Even though they're writing well after the fact, they don't reflect back. Let's give an example from John. John chapter 2, verses 17 to 22. Where are we at? Almost 225. Okay. John 2, 17 to 22. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. They remembered after the fact. So the Jews replied to him, what sign of authority would you give us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this sanctuary and I will rise up, raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, the sanctuary took 46 years to build and we raise it up in three days. But he was thinking about the sanctuary of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. The other gospels don't reflect it back that way. John 12, 12 and 18. The next day, when the Lord Jesus Lord crowd had come to the huge festival, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one, the king of Israel. Jesus got a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear no more, God of eyes. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. In other words, John's giving the reasoning behind it. He's saying, this is how he felt. This is how he, how he worked. And later, this is the change that happened in us. The other disciples, other gospels, don't give us that. I'm going to call it there for now. There's a lot more here that you said. Um, stuff I want to go into. More of what is being taught here uh, between verses 1 and 14 especially. But I'll cover that next week. Uh, hopefully you've gotten something out of this. We need to understand why God wrote it. It's correct. To make sure we knew the truth. That to fight the false teachers. We still have those false teachers with us today. We need to know the truth, and John is giving it to us. John is thinking about what he's written and giving us a reasoning behind it. John is the author, and Christ is God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for giving us this gospel. Teach us from it, Lord. Lord, if we haven't sat down and read it at one sitting, help us. Help me to do so again. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, 741. Oh. Verses 1 and 2.